to the Baumer lecture series. Over the course of this semester, we've invited design professionals, practitioners, and scholars to discuss how we might engage with the network of sociopolitical and environmental resources which we generally consider as commons. But the question of commons, beyond the idea of common resources, common wealth, or common goods, is also about common grounds. And tonight's event is perhaps the best example of that. Going against our own common lecture setup, we have not just one, but two distinguished speakers. Our guests, Mary Margaret Jones and Charles Renfro, don't really need any introduction. More than highly accomplished practitioners, leaders, or representatives of their own fields, they embody design professionals who really operate within that common ground. Mary Margaret Jones is the president and CEO of Hargreaves Jones, a landscape architecture and planning firm. She's worked on and led numerous large scale and complex projects, including the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in London, the Scissorto Park in Oklahoma, University of Cincinnati's campus here in our beloved state, and the Commons in Minneapolis, just to name a few. Her firm's outstanding work has been widely exhibited, published, and recognized by over 100 uh, national and international awards, including the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award, the Rosa Barber International Landscape Prize, and more recently, the ASLA's land, uh, landmark award for their project, Chrissy Field, in, in San Francisco. She holds board positions with the American Academy in Rome, the Architectural League of New York, the Regional Plan Associations, uh, Association, and the ODC Dance in San Francisco. And she's a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects, fellow of the Urban Design Forum in New York, and a senior fellow of the Design Futures Council. Joining her is Charles Renfro, a partner at Diller Scofidio and Renfro, a design practice which many of you know, that works across architecture, urban design, installation, art, and multimedia. He's led design and con construction of some of DSR's most iconic projects, including the Blur Building, my favorite, uh, the ICA in Boston, the redesign and expansion of the Juilliard School and the Alice Tolley Hall at the Lincoln Center, the High Line, and more recently, Columbia Business School in New York, again, among many others. DSR's work has been exhibited worldwide at museums and institutions like MoMA, the Whitney, the CCA, Centre Pompidou, and the Storefront for Art and Architecture, where Charles actually exhibited his own independent art and architectural work. Charles is also a notable LGBTQ leader. He's the co-president of BAFO, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, a nonprofit organization that supports and promotes the work of artists and designers, especially in the LGBTQ community, as well as black, indigenous, and people of color. Now, DSR's work has been widely recognized with numerous awards, also including the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award and the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship that recognized DSR for exploring, I quote, how space functions in our culture and illustrating that architecture when understood as the physical manifestation of social relationships is everywhere, not just in buildings. And I think that holistic approach to design is really what distinguishes both our speakers and their respective practices. But aside from the long list of their professional accomplishments, what you may not know about Mary Margaret and Charles is that in fact they grew up in the same town in Baytown, in the suburbs of Houston. Uh, and while they didn't know each other back then, they meet decades later in New York, and they come together to work on multiple projects across the world, from Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive in California, uh, and the US Olympic and Paralympic Museum in Colorado, to the Tianjin Juilliard School in China, and the Zaryadeh Park in Moscow, Russia. Together, their collaborative projects show us not just the necessity of working together around the same table often, but also the reality that when dealing with complex and increasingly large uh, problems, we simply don't work in isolation. 
And perhaps this is to dispel the dis disciplinary myth and the binary approaches that present the world in terms of conflicts and contradictions, nature and culture, gardens and machines, landscapes and buildings. Instead, in favor of a more holistic or more holistic propositions that consider our domain as designers as something that is at once natural and artificial, social and technological, local and global. Now, this unique occasion also demands a unique format. So this is why tonight's event with the two of them is, is not a duel or a debate or not even a duet. It's really a dialogue in a true sense of the word. So Mary Margaret and Charles will present their work jointly together. They will then be joined by our landscape architecture and architecture section heads, Christy Shermie and Fu Hong, which I can't find them. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, and they will uh, be moderating the conversation. I also want to thank both Fu and, and Christy for, for all their work for making this event possible. Uh, and then we'll then end open to the floor for Q&A. But I would just like to remind you that the lecture uh, is just the first part of the event. So, and I would like to kindly ask you all to remain seated until the end of the moderated conversation and Q&A. Now with that, please join me in welcoming Mary Margaret Jones and Charles Redford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. <clears throat> Ah, uh, let's see. Here how, we are. how do we do this? Um, okay. Well, we've lectured together before, so it's not not new. Yeah, it's not new. But um, well, just maybe to start by saying that yeah, we grew up in the same town, d just two blocks away from each other, actually. Um, and Amazing. apparently, Mary Margaret went out with my brother in first, went, in in first, first grade, grade. In first grade. So we go way back. And I guess you know we didn't know each other. We hadn't worked professionally until about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And then we kind of, our paths crossed and it was like, ka -ching. We were like magnets. And, yeah. uh, and partly because, you know, when you grow up in the same place, you, you just have a shorthand when you work together. You mm -hmm. don't, you just don't really, you're like, it's just like that Dr. Pepper, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, those, those bubbles. <laughs> anyway, or something, but uh, well, so we're gonna we're gonna kind of tag team this and just inter interrupt me whenever you want. Uh, I'm gonna start with a couple um, projects that we've done. You probably know us for making museums, which we've done quite a few of um, and are doing a few more. Um, but what we like to do with our museums is make them more accessible to more people more of the time. Um, we like to say that our work is. Um, democratic but I, I don't want to abuse that word and a lot of people use it in ways that don't mean that you know in a political sense that that you're voting but you vote with your feet i suppose and access is really one of the ways that you can um you can vote with your feet we do a lot of academic buildings and we love academic buildings because they allow us to bring pedagogy into form um, and these buildings are often thought of as tools to educate um, people and also to bring students, staff, faculty, and the public in direct contact with one another. And then I'm going to focus on three jobs really fast, um, sort of just an intro, to speak about our fascination with the merger of landscape and design, landscape architecture and architectural design, and um, what brings Mary Margaret and us together. And, and we've worked on several projects like this, but we didn't work together on the High Line, 1.5 miles of disused train uh, tracks that go on the west side of Manhattan. And just going to time us. Hold on one second. ID. Okay. Um, and w we were, you know, I like to think that our work is very contextual. And even though it doesn't mimic um, other architectures that it sits near, it actually tries to mine a site and its DNA. And for the High Line, we were intrigued by how 
the, the line had fallen apart and nature had taken over, including growing through the cracks. And that became, uh, the, the nature was growing through the cracks, and that became uh, our inspiration for making the sort of single element that we designed that let us do the line in, in its entirety, which is a tapered plank that let the line, uh, let, the, let the plants grow through the cracks and let us make meandering pathways that didn't have curbs or edges, a little bit like your roof garden. I'm really excited about that roof garden. It was the first time I'd seen it today, but it's really, truly wild. And I think Mary Margaret and I, in, in the projects that we've worked on together, we really like to bring a sense of wildness and discovery to the projects. Um, we also, I think, as it was mentioned, we like to design for people, a whole bunch of different kinds of people. We like to bring diversity into our projects as best we can. Um, and so at the Highline, we thought, um, let's think about the people in New York City, especially in the territories that the line passes through, such as the Meatpacking District, which was home to, well, a lot of nefarious activity at one point. We wanted to try to you know, acknowledge that history and even if not encourage it to continue. And we take advantage of, of um, the places where we build um, in unconventional ways, we think, such as the passage over 10th Avenue, which became a theater. Um, and then the last project I'm gonna speak about um, of our own, which is, is a landscape pro project in my opinion, although it's not exactly a green project, it's the Museum of Image and Sound in um, Rio de Janeiro. And uh, here we, it's a, it's a building dedicated to artists, um, Brazilian artists and, and artists that are doing work about Rio. And so since it's a building about Rio for Rio artists and for, for Carioca, Cariocas, we wanted to, and it's on the beach on Copacabana Beach, we wanted to build the building out of the beach. Um, and so we, uh, we wove a walkway uh, that you can uh, access free of charge up the facade of the building that gets you to a park that we developed on the top. And it went, it, it stalled for about six years. It's now being finished uh, and should open in about a year's time. Uh, oh, sorry, one more project, and this is the um, this is the Vagelos Center at the Columbia University Medical Center. It's 168th Street on the west side of Manhattan. Really tight area of Manhattan, and we had a really tight lot uh, that was zoned incredibly skinny and, and tall. Um, there was no central place for people to gather in this entire campus, so we, what we decided to do was remake the... Um, uh, the building uh, by pushing all of the shared spaces to the south edge and linking them up together with a with a uh, meandering um, social stair that expands and contracts into teaching spaces, informal, both formal and informal meeting spaces, uh, outdoor spaces, and a cafe. Uh, oh gosh, another project, sorry. This, <laughs> I forgot I put this in here. Anyway, lastly, I think it was lastly, Link, uh, Lincoln Center, uh, we were asked to think about the public space at Lincoln Center. Uh, this is many years ago now. Um, and what we decided to do was to essentially take all the essence of Lincoln Center that was great. This is the kind of 745 minute, you know, those minutes before the curtain when it was teeming with activity and life and light and it glowed and try to bring that to the tried to bring that to the campus all day long and um, and all evening long we did we use landscape uh, in in a kind of architectural fashion here covering a new restaurant um, that was open to the public uh, and and also could be used um, to serve performance okay here we go here we go all right so and just chime in like when I say something yeah. wrong I'm probably gonna get the dates wrong <laughs> so about um, 10 years ago, I think it was about 10 years ago, uh, 2013, uh, we were asked to, to join a competition, competition to design Zari Idea Park. This was an international competition that was uh, set up by the group of people that you see uh, on this screen. The, this is uh, Friends of Zari Idea. It was is modeled on the Friends of the High Line. Uh, that 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 sponsored the competition and ultimately have taken over the High Line. So it's a kind of grassroots uh, movement uh, that came from citizens. These uh, folks on the picture, uh, a lot of them are designers and uh, other professionals that are uh, affiliated with design. 
But they saw the site in the middle of Moscow, uh, right off of Red Square, as a kind of uh, piece of urban blight, an eyesore. It was, uh, had been the site of a humongous hotel called the Hotel Roycia, and it was taken down a few years earlier. And this group wanted to turn the site into a park, as opposed to a commercial development, which, which other people in the government of Moscow had wanted to turn it into commercial. And, and they were really smart, because if any of you recognize a couple of the people in the previous photo or this photo, um, they, that's Ed Euler in, in the foreground in the other picture in the middle of this one. He helped make Millennium Park happen in Chicago. There's also people who helped make Central Park Conservancy happen in, in New York City. So these friends of Zariadia were smart and pulled together uh, experts from around the world who knew how to make parks happen. So they launched an international competition. They had the Strelka Institute write the brief. Uh, it was the best uh, competition brief I'd ever read, and we have done plenty of them. It, so uh, while Mary Margaret and I had talked about doing this, we both read the brief, and I said, huh, this is maybe not not doesn't feel like a Russian competition. It feels like a global competition. Should we do this together? We had both talked about it mm -hmm. and sort of decided that we wouldn't, that it's like just too risky, mm -hmm. too weird. Mm -hmm. But we read, the, we read the brief and we saw the jury and we had some friends on the jury. Yeah, we did, yeah. thank goodness. Mm -hmm, that helps. Yeah. And, and so we decided to do it together and we, we, ha we joined up with um, an urbanist uh, called City Makers that has an office in Moscow and an office in Copenhagen. Um, and and so it was a, a three-legged, just like this. M I think there's a diagram that shows it. Yeah, coming up. Um, and this is this is a, this was the jury deliberation. It was it was a, you know a very good jury, international jury. Um, we, we thought we had no chance of winning because we were the only American-led team. Oh right. And uh, we based our scheme on freedom of movement. We'll talk, we'll come back to that. But we based our scheme on openness and freedom of. Excellent. And so, so this is, you know, we, we won. We, uh, we, won. we, we were yeah. we were super shocked, and they immediately flew us over to um, to Moscow to this press briefing that you see uh, us doing here um, in a hotel that we spent lots of time in after that. Um, and so, just this is just to say that we started this project together from day one, sitting in the same room, working on the same drawing, sometimes sharing the same piece of trace. Um, and you know, it's this was a park project, kind of first and foremost, but it was also a, a significant piece of cultural architecture. There were th there were to be three new cultural institutions within the park: mm -hmm. uh, a nature center, a media sort of entertainment center, a new Philharmonic Hall, and then there were to be two commercial parts uh, in the park, including a, a destination restaurant and a kind of market facility. So 250,000 square feet of enclosed space within the park. Right, and other teams made buildings in a park. Right. And I think part of the reason we won is because you can't, find, you almost, don't see the buildings. We'll come back to that. So this is this was one of the early design workshops. I, this Peter should have gone before, but this is one of the early design workshops that we had. And you can see Mary Margaret there, and um, various people from Transolar, and um, all of our consultants from Germany, and everybody divert and, uh, uh, c c uh, descended into to our offices in New York City, and we were working on it together. This shows the location uh, next to the Kremlin. We just love putting that up. Uh, Putin's Putin's land, helicopter landing pad is is literally just about uh, 300 feet from the southwest corner of our park. Um, and like I said, this is uh, the Hotel Rossiya was a 3,000 room uh, hotel that the Soviet Union had erected, um, famous hotel, one of the world's largest, and they took it down knowing they wanted to redevelop the site. But the initial thoughts were commercial, and they uh, hired Foster to do a big commercial scheme. And I can't remember, why did that fail again? Uh, the ruble. <laughs> it the failed ruble, the because ruble it took care of that. Because the ruble, the ruble fell. <laughs> Um, and Thank God, because it was just a big, giant shopping complex. It was shopping in a couple office buildings. And then um, the other thing that happened was that the chief architect of Moscow, Sergei Kuznetsov, uh, was trained partly in the West and was a huge believer in, in um, good city making. And had a 
talk with the big man on the hill? Well, really, it was the mayor. And, I mean, it, the, oh, mayor, the mayor, the mayor yes. of Moscow. Yeah. We promised ourselves we won't talk about Russia. We talk about Moscow because it's a city and it's a world city. And the people in this city worked with us so closely. And really, it's the mayor who, who was trying to transform and has in many ways transformed Moscow into a pedestrian friendly city. Yeah. Ultimately, that guy. He did sort of try to claim all this, but he really, it really it was it's a grassroots. It's Sibyoyan, is that his name? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a grassroots effort that really that made this park happen. So um, our idea, I'm going to go through the idea slides, or were you going to do the idea slides? Um, in two, I think yeah. there's two, two more that you okay. do. I mean, just point out the, the fact the, that yeah. there's that 120,000 square feet. Yeah. You don't even, you hardly. 200, 200, 250,000 square feet, yeah, not including the Philharmonic Hall. Right. And we'll explain where these bits and pieces are, but the Philharmonic Hall is, um, is over, over here underneath uh, what we call the crust. And the other, the other bits, oops, sorry. The other bits are, are embedded in the, um, in the landscape design. So our big idea was, um, was called wild urbanism. And, and it stemmed from a notion that we, uh, that this site being so close to the central monuments of Moscow, um, could make a really surreal uh, contribution to landscape architecture by bringing native Russian landscapes into the city. And I think you're going to continue from and here. You can see in the background of that slide was St. Basil's, which is, it looks like a fairy tale place. And we did a lot of research into the history of forest and nature in, 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 in Russian culture. And it's very much in their fairy tales. It's very much in their music. But it's always like nature over there. But in the city, like the Kremlin, which you see in this slide, it's like a thousand tulips, all the same color, all in a row. And there's nothing in between. And so the idea of bringing nature into the city, wild urbanism, and the paving of, the, of, uh, of Red Square with a thousand trees planted. Right. So, I think these are, these are there yours. There we go. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea was to take the landscapes of Russia and portray them in, in, the, in the park. Uh, to bring all of the country together in a landscape sense. And this is wetlands, forests, steppe, which is plains or meadows, tundra, which is way high. And it was very, uh, very handy that the site, the site had this amazing slope to it. So the site sloped from north east to southwest pretty dramatically, as you see in this cross section. So we were able to illustrate tundra, steppe, forest, and wetland and also create them with plants that would grow in Moscow. And then you can see the bottom diagram is how this, the site had this sort of natural tip to it. And then the ideas of creating these folds within that natural slope. Uh, so to tuck then program within those folds, and that's how that 250,000 square feet is embedded in the landscape. So it really was a collaboration of, of disciplines, but also a collaboration of ideas and a collaboration of materials, if you will, landscape and building. Basically, none of, none of the built environments took away from access to any of the green environments that are on the park. So it, it maintained a kind of close to 100% green surface. And then finding the plants that would work in Moscow and that would work seasonally. You know, they kept reminding us. Of course, it's funny. Most people in the States think that Moscow is Siberia. It's not. It's basically Minneapolis in terms of climate. Uh, but still, to find plants that would work all year round and that would grow in Moscow was a, a very early and important uh, effort. And then the paving. And to come up with a system of paving on that, on the, those undulations of landscape, that was somewhat directionless. We we like those thousand rows, those thousand tulips in a row. The, the the pathways, like in Gorky Park, you know, were very defined with curves, and so the idea was to come up with paving that would that would pixelate across the site, and that would dissipate and be blurred with the the landscape. Uh, so to create a kind of series of ways you could move through the site, but enabling you to get lost and enabling, enabling you to find the city. So lose the city and find the city uh, by moving through the site. What, one thing that they had wanted to do early on was to put a fence and gates around the park, and we convinced them at some point yeah. that the park should remain open and accessible from multiple entry points and not have gates. 
Um, and this was fairly unusual uh, for a Russian park to be that, yeah, that but open. It, it's almost like they weren't so against it. It just never occurred to them. It was like so right. foreign as an idea. Yeah. And then, of course, the flyover bridge, which we'll come back to, also took some convincing. <laughs> <laughs> so this idea of the landscape and the fingers of landscape and the fingers of paving, uh, which then allowed us to collect all the water and store it and reuse it on the site, uh, or at least most of it. In the end, we weren't able to collect all of it, but still it, was a, it, was, it happened for a good part of the site. And so it was not only a kind of experiential thing, and I think one of the things that pulls us together is we're both so interested in the phenomena and, and amplifying the phenomena and making things that are remarkable, and so you find yourself paying attention because it's it's remarkable. It's odd. It's not what you normally see. Mm -hmm. um, and then creating these uh, openings in the forest, these meadows, and the lighting, you can see the lighting, having the lighting as clusters, not as lining a sidewalk, but as clusters. Some of those pavers extrude up and become places to sit. The other thing we were trying to do was to make a park that was accessible to more people, more of the year, uh, in a climate that is generally cold, although not cold in the summer <coughs> but to take it stays light in the summer till midnight so you're you're suddenly you're drinking and you're like oh my god i have to go to bed yeah right <laughs> and hopefully you don't fall on your face um on the way and rip your favorite prada suit that only happened once though um anyway i digress <laughs> um uh, so uh, w the park is is really an energy uh, an energy sink uh, in the summer months um, we take uh, sun energy through PV panels that are on this gra glass crust and we actually turn it into refrigerant that that makes ice and is in an ice cave this actually didn't come to pass but I'm gonna pretend that it did because mm -hmm. it was designed and it was very close to working um, and it also the Sun also uh, heats underneath the glass crust in the winter to make it a completely comfortable even in a Moscow snowstorm. Um, so the way that that glass crust works is it, it uh, covers a hill that in itself is covering the Philharmonic Hall. So the park just runs up over the Philharmonic Hall and you can access the, the top of that hill uh, where you find yourself under a glass crust and if the sun is out uh, you the temperature changes by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit um, and uh, you know allows people to disrobe or you know at least be uh, able to be out of the wind and the snow for a minute um, and there are several other places uh, in the site these moments where the where the landscape pull, peels over the architecture we have skylights in a few of those locations that also harness sun energy to make a warmer a naturally warmer environment during uh, during the the winter months uh, and deflect uh, deflect sun during the summer months uh, and basically passively manages the, the environment um, so this is the this was our uh, design at the competition, um, and this is Mary Margaret and my hands together. I think. I think yeah, that's my hand in the lower right. Yeah, hand. exactly. And the, so yeah. we this was one of our. Yours are moving <clears throat> too fast. Too. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of our first sketches, you know, where we where we came up with the idea of the overlapped different landscapes, and those overlaps were it was a really exciting moment when we figured out that we could house all of the program within the overlaps. Um, this is this is it, it's built <clears throat> the way we drew it. So everything was building being built at the same time, the the landscape and the buildings. And Four thousand <clears throat> people on the site building this project around the clock. It, pretty much around the clock, and uh, it we didn't. There was a period of about a year that we didn't go. Mm -hmm. They didn't really want us to go because they didn't want us to interfere with the construction. Um, and we we were we we were kind of holding our breath when we got yeah. to Moscow that time, and when we saw it was almost finished, and we couldn't believe it. They actually. Uh, this is our, our competition entry, and that's what they built. They actually built it pretty much completely faithfully to, uh, to our design. For the landscape architects, though, some of the, it was easier in a way for the building bits 
for the landscape bits, it was harder because we had to work with local botanical people and horticultural people to convince them that the plants we wanted were okay, that these plants that seemed like not nice plants to them were what we really meant, and that soil really had to be you know, this deep, and that the system of the pavers and the soil for the plants and the irrigation, this is how it works. So we got out there you know, in the field with our hands in the dirt and uh, really had to work with them. Um, so uh, you can see that some of the, some of the main features include an overlook bridge, a bridge to nowhere that uh, cantilevers 75 meters over the Moscow River, uh, made entirely in concrete. This is one of the changes. We got there and it was made in concrete. We couldn't believe it was made at all. And then it stood up. We had designed it in steel because that's that's what we use for 75 meter cantilevers. But um, it's still there, I yeah. think, although we haven't been in recent years as you could imagine. And they were really, con we really had to do some convincing. I think we had to like threaten to take our name off the project at one point right. to get that to fly over bridge. Yeah, that's right. Um, anyway, but here you can see the effect that Mary Margaret was describing where, um, you know, th thickets of natural forest with diverse tree species um, were, were and some of these trees existed, but we added to them and 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 made you know forest from scratch. We planted a thousand trees. You can see the birch forest here. This is all brand new planting, yeah. and for the first time, people in Moscow could not only walk on meandering paths, they could actually leave the path. This is the first park in Moscow where, where people were encouraged to to go out into the green. And they did it, and they dropped litter and all kinds of other things, but um, it was really super exciting to see people using the park uh, in ways that were of their own determination. They, we, we didn't have to tell them how to use the park. This is the tundra landscape, so, and it's above, the, the educational center is below it, and so in the education these are, you, maybe you can see some of the skylights down to the educational center where there were then, a gr there's a greenhouse growing real tundra, tundra plants, the, the ones that are so fragile that we couldn't plant here, but a lot of it translated. And this is one of the entrances to, I think this is the entrance to the media um, pavilion, which is one of the elements that's tucked underneath the landscape. This is one of the skylights, of the skylights yeah. down to, down to the, um, I think the, the nature center. Um, anyway, people were really excited to witness the park. It was unlike anything they'd ever seen, you know, clearly. Um, and I think people were just generally um, surprised at how much access we had given uh, to them. And also that we had made places for lots of people to gather because there was a, a clause in the brief yeah. that said explicitly, you'll make this park so that people will always keep moving and no one will ever, no one will stay stationary that for they long. they won't gather in large crowds. And they won't gather. So instead, we made an amphitheater that seats 5,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and somehow it got snuck in, and and uh, I think I didn't put the oh I have the World Cup picture coming up, um, and so this is this is that the park going up over the Philharmonic Hall and un, un, into the glass crust. This is uh, this is our opening weekend, um, and they hadn't quite finished the plant planting, but the the lawn is there. You can see the flowers and pots on the top um, and and people kept stealing the pots of flowers because they thought they were like a, an opening weekend gift a takeaway a takeaway um, and so there so you know it was written up immediately people are stealing the flowers in Zarianje park <laughs> uh, anyway that was a bad accent um, and this is uh, the first winter it opened, and, and uh, this is New Year's, uh, and you can see the snow outside and the green of the grass above. Right. We had to remind them that that meant they needed to water the grass year-round, irrigate it. Yeah. And then they overlook, again, the 75-metered uh, can cantilever over uh, the roadway that um, the reason Mary Margaret was saying that we almost didn't get this because the, the, the Kremlin drives their motorcade down this road whenever they come and go from Moscow. And they were worried that someone could mm -hmm. drop a bomb or a hang grenade on the motorcade. 
Um, I don't know, kind of crazy. Uh, too bad someone didn't. Sorry. Oh, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, this has become one of Moscow's um, most uh, visited tourist sites. It's a, it's a must uh, it's a must see selfie location because you can see all of Moscow's greatest monuments, including St. Basil's and the Kremlin, uh, and some of some of the Stalin buildings from this bridge. Yeah, I think that that high rise in the background, one of the Seven Sisters, is where yeah. I had my first Aperol spritz in all places Moscow. Yeah, there's a, it's a Radisson hotel yeah. now. <laughs> anyway, people go to it year round and still do. We got photos of a fashion show that happened this past year, which is a little dispiriting, but um, a little bit ahead in the sand. Yeah, a little bit. So anyway, so and we had over a million uh, visitors in less than a month. So this was well on its way to becoming uh, um, one of Moscow's most visited locations. Oh, yeah. Here's the World Cup that happened maybe a year after we opened with about 5000 people gathered on that yeah. uh, on that slope. Uh, and it was voted to as one of the world's greatest places in 2018. But more mo most excitingly, most most exciting to me uh, is the fact that people really started using the park, using it, going onto the green, bringing blankets, having picnics, uh, you know, going there at night, going there during the day, going there during the winter, going there during the summer, making, you know, pr proposing or getting married on the site or simply just going to the bushes. <laughs> and um, and I guess more than a, a, a critical, a critically positive review that we might have wished for in an architectural journal, this was actually the best review we could get. Exactly. Uh, like and so and this, freedom. Yeah, exactly. So, and this is the second second best review is that we found ourselves on a on a uh, stamp. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, and this is the team, and and we really became friends with all of our folks there. Um, it's it's become a little awkward these days. Uh, I I still do try to reach out to to some of the folks, but it was a, a highly highly professional team, uh, highly integrated team, uh, with a, a incredible respect. Um, till the very end and we, we've returned several times to speak at urban uh, conferences there about the park and other projects. Um, one thing I wanted to say about how they built it, I, I forgot to mention this, is some of the contractors didn't have, um, uh, we have 12 minutes left, <laughs> sorry. Um, there was a little bit of introduction. So yeah, that's true. Bit. Well, I didn't start until after we got here. Okay. Um, anyway, but uh, so they, the, the, a lot of the contractors didn't know how to read drawings, and, and mm -hmm. it was such a complicated, three-dimensionally complicated exactly. uh, project that they built a humongous model, about half the size of this room, you know, with everything down to like, you know, uh, joints in the concrete and you know all the tree placements and they would bring the contractors into the model room and they would say this is how the model this is how to build this project right. and they would walk away and they would go do it and they and as we said they did it pretty much like <laughs> we drew we had a, we did a lot of research we went to other parks <laughs> met the chinchillas and that that's that's the core group uh, of folks including that's, just, uh, that's the city art the the shorter the man on the right Right, is the city architect, a really good architect in his own right, and uh, yeah, yeah, made this happen. Okay, okay so I'm going to go really fast. Most of you probably know our work. I didn't do a sort of greatest hits, but I am doing a little bit of a dive, but I'll make it very quick, into Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, which was not in central London. It was in the east end of London, where it was, you know, toxic and crime-ridden and pestilence and Jack the Ripper, historically. So an industrial site, highly polluted. They had to bake all the soil in trucks at 500 degrees to make it banal. One of the things we did when we came in, and there was, of course, a, a time crunch, because there always is for, you know, an Olympics, is we worked in clay, and we were using the material that there would actually be on site. So the amount of clay we had was the amount of dirt we had. So we were able to move that around, reveal, come up with a plan that we reveal the river, celebrate the river instead of channelizing. This was a channelized river, highly polluted. And then I always love this shot of the, how the clay model continued to evolve. And then you see on the right uh, the built result. So <clears throat> building in a river is very tricky. So those uh, orange lines are porous fences so the water can move through as you're establishing wetland plants and then creating all these levels so that you can experience the games uh, from different vantage points. That's the uh, 
that's the uh, the bicycling venue in the background, uh, which I think is one of the mo more beautiful buildings. But it created a series of places where people could gather to watch the games. After post games, these all became habitat meadows. We were instructed, and it works for thousands of people or one person. We were instructed to leave behind 24 different biohabitats. And even in the Olympic Gardens, uh, they didn't want to do, because they're the Brits, they didn't want to do a fountain. They wanted to do gardens in the British tradition of gathering plants from all over the world. We made, a th we made themed gardens that are themed on the biozones of the countries that come uh, to the games. Uh, and in this part of the park, we were terracing the river, uh, so less natural sculpt sculpting and more sort of architectural t uh, terracing. Uh, but the mayor of London called the, the gardens the winners of the game <laughs> and greatly loved. Um, and still a, used a lot. And still used a ton. Of course, Amish Kapoor is not quite so happy about the fact that the orbit in the background is now a slide and you pay to go up and slide down. <clears throat> but what was tricky about it was planning for a precise moment in time, these different systems of ecology and use and community, but then letting them unfurl to become systems that would grow and change and evolve over time. So that's really, we, we often say we're setting landscapes in motion. We're not designing, we're setting things in motion. And creating with the with the plan on the left, also legacy planning, transformational planning, they called it, uh, to create a series of open spaces that would link from the Olympic site into the growing new communities around it. So uh, these green fingers, very important green destinations, not only for ecological reasons, but for development asset reasons. So because we grew up outside of Houston, I want to quickly show you Discovery Green. This was in the 80s. This was what Houston is like, vast parking lots. And then that's what Discovery Green is like mm, a few years ago. Uh, so there were, you may have noticed, there were those oak trees. That's what we had to work with, those oak trees. And those oak trees inspired the sort of striations of the park, which is organized in a series of outdoor rooms. You can move through these outdoor rooms, and there's not only water to play in, but there's water to float boats in or freeze and ice skate in. So people are playing in the fountain in their bathing suits while some people are ice skating on the rink at Thanksgiving, because you know it's Houston. Uh, and there's art that's specific to the park, and uh, there's temporal art that comes every, every holiday season. The faces of Houstonians are Bruce Monroe's Field of Light that brings people in the winter. And the amazing story of the transformation of this part of downtown Houston is just phenomenal, a billion dollars of development around the park because of this park. Not just counting all the ones that happened downtown, but the ones that happened in red that say they happened because of the park. But what I really love about this is the pie chart, which says, why do you come to Discovery Green? And the majority of the people come because it's outdoors, it's landscape, it's free not because of the programming. So we don't need to over-program our parks. Sometimes just creating nature and wild, which is what we did in Moscow, mm -hmm. is, uh, is enough. <clears throat> and then I just wanted to briefly touch on a recent project, another way of working with a, an architect we collaborate with a lot, Michael Maltzen. This is the Sixth Street Viaduct Bridge in Los Angeles that you may have read about. It opened. They opened it just to pedestrians the first weekend. People loved that so much, it was hard to get the pedestrians off the bridge when it was open to cars. And it was hard to keep the cars from not just making it a festival ground, um, but actually a place to move traffic. But uh, gradually, people have adjusted. And the dirt that you see in the right-hand image under the bridge is where this is now being built. So we are building the park that extends under the bridge. Um, and will look like this. So creating a place in this that knits the east side of London, I mean uh, Los Angeles, which is, uh, which is Boyle Heights, which is anti-gentrification with the west side of the river, which is the arts district, which is total gentrification. So bringing those two sides of the Los Angeles River together in a common open space that has something for everyone. So now is our last project, so we'll move pretty quickly. Uh, this is Tianjin, China. This is 2005. It was heavily industrial, heavy, heavily industrial. Now note 2013, high rises everywhere. And if you can see the cursor, this park, which was the park we designed on the Haihei River. And again, you see it here with all this development planned and all these green spaces along the Haihei River. 
Uh, so our, our goal was to create a thick edge to the river to be a contrast to this amazing density of urban, of urban planning and to create a series of layers of open spaces and water cleaning all the, or filtering all the stormwater before it emptied into the Hihei River. Here it is, it's still in construction or just finishing construction. One of the things we were interested in was it, it, it's really not a, a culture of playing soccer, for instance, or throwing a frisbee, for instance, but it is a place of promenading. And surrounding Tianjin are tons of horticultural nurseries. So we were very interested in it, kind of expressing that kind of landscape of nursery plantings um, and creating promenades and destinations. So you see that sort of thickened edge of landscape thousands of trees against that very, very urban edge. And this is more recently. And then you see the project we worked on together, Tianjin Juilliard, right across the river from that. Yes, so um, we won a competition to to do uh, Juilliard's first uh, campus outside of New York City. It would be a full-fledged Juilliard school <clears throat> with faculty that are shared between New York and Tianjin um, with some 300 some, some odd students. Um, and the site was really in between these two new central business districts based on, designed by SOM based on Manhattan. And, you know, as Mary Margaret said, you know, there, there was, there's not a lot of stuff to do there, actually, and so we wanted Juilliard to not only be a school for the Juilliard students, but also to be a magnet for the, the city itself and to open itself up as best it could and to give as many of its programs uh, away <clears throat> to the general public. The other thing that we had to deal with, <clears throat> happily so, is that we were bu building on an actual park site and they allowed us to build in the park site. So our party uh, chose to use the performance venues, the, the four performance venues, a concert hall, a recital hall, a black box theater, and three smaller chamber music halls as uh, essentially structural uh, pavilions to hold up all the teaching spaces and to let the park roll through the lobby. The lobby is really considered an indoor-outdoor space. Um, those are the four pavilions that hold up the built the teaching spaces, and the teaching spaces are five bridges that, that span and crisscross between the, the four pavilions. Each of those uh, bridges is glass covered. Uh, every single um, practice room, every single classroom, every single teaching studio has glass exposure either to the outside or down uh, into the lobby, which is, as I said before, essentially an extension of the park space. We wanted to bring um, uh, you know, the public inside uh, sort of seamlessly. So there's six different doors into this giant lobby. Um, and that the trees uh, come inside from the outside. Uh, this is, I'm going to go really quickly. You, you can go up to the teaching floors from a grand stair, uh, and there you would, you'll find single loaded corridors <coughs> with practice rooms on one side. So people can see down to the lobby and people can see up to peep to the students practicing. Um, and so there's a sense of community, of communion, and of learning. Um, while classical music in China is, is quite appreciated, it's also unknown to a lot of people. Um, this is the symphony hall uh, with, with a window to the outside. Uh, all of our spaces, we wanted to make feel connected to the landscape and to the park. Um, those, of course, can be <coughs> darkened out uh, so that you can make a completely contained space. Uh, there's an event space on the top that has a, a, a beautiful view to, to Mary Margaret's Park on the other side of the river. Um, and just a couple of in-use uh, photos. This opened during COVID, and we haven't been, but I think we're going to go in a month and a half now that they've lift, lifted restrictions. Um, they, they have a full program in operation. Uh, and the lobby itself is also considered a performance space. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and embedded in, in the building are all of, uh, all of these uh, group uh, gathering spaces. Uh, and that's what it looks like from Mary Margaret's Park. Yeah, we wanted to bring, we wanted to ha have it feel like the river came into the side. And so to have the building sit in this uh, water landscape was part of it. And I would say the relationship to the river and the, the sort of push, push and pull between 
how to relate to the building and the performance space of the building and how to also relate to the river and the bend of the river because this is the where the river bends and has to have a hard edge because it, a lot of velocity of water hits this bend. So landscape diagrams that were building on this idea of the pavilions <coughs> and the different sort of layers of landscape from garden through the building to the performance space to the river was a whole sequence of spaces. So that's the landscape plan that shows that kind of dichotomy. Oh. See, we're not doing so bad. Yeah, that's right. Sort of dichotomy of this big, beautiful arch, this big, long arc to the river, but then these, this turns and becomes a kind of amphitheater to the stage, which is right here. So you enter from the city through these gardens, uh, out to this uh, performance area, this amphitheater area. Of course, obviously, these are the renderings uh, to the river. And then the relationship from the park across the river that we designed, and then the built result, which again, we don't have current ones. We can't wait to get there and see it. But this was uh, soon after construction. And event, the city probably looks like this now. They they finally started finishing the buildings. They were okay. doing that right before COVID. Yeah. Um, I I was shocked to yeah. to learn, learn. Anyway, that's it that's from it. us. Thank you very much. And I guess. All right. Well, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, it's. Uh, <laughs> This is a, we've been looking, Boo and I've been looking forward to this, talking about this for a year now, so we really appreciate you uh, joining us on this. Um, I want to start by going back to something that uh, Iman brought up at the beginning in the introduction. He talked about common ground, and that's been the kind of unifying theory, uh, theme of our lecture series. Uh, and I want to talk about it in the context of structuring collaboration. Um, and um, I want to try to tease out some of the specific ingredients that make you good and successful collaborators. Um, I'm sh there's certainly a social side to that uh, and uh, a mutual respect, uh, comparable demeanors, curiosity and shared interests. Uh, but I bet there are other factors at play that go beyond interpersonal dynamics and uh, venture into office structure and design process. And uh, I think our, our students often talk about not, and we spoke about this last week, uh, not really knowing who should make a decision first or how design decisions should be interwoven or pushed on each other. Uh, and this is something that you've honed over many years with really large projects. Uh, so could you talk about how your offices and your teams are structured to enable the kind of work that you're doing uh, and maybe what students should be looking for if they want to be part of offices that are doing this kind of work? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I'll start. Um, I think we, we, early in our career, we did a lot of work collaborating with artists. And we quickly sort of learned the difference between collaborating and coordinating. And coordinating is what most people do and they call it collaboration. And that's not collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, collaboration is when you uh, are sort of partners and you're, you're pushing and pulling on each other. But it requires people who are comfortable in their own skin. So I think it has a lot to do with searching out collaborators who you respect and who respect you. Mm -hmm. So I think it does have a lot to do with being comfortable in your own skin enough to let go of your ego and actually let someone else have influence over what, what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, you, and, you, know, you, you have to not be afraid to say, ah, that's not, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. or, uh, or take take criticism yourself, and, and right. I, that gets to your point of being comfortable. Um, I know that in our office, before we started working together, you know, we've always been a collaborative office. Liz and Rick, before I even became a partner there, were working with, you know, with uh, musicians and choreographers and statisticians and technologists, and uh, all of these projects were, and writers, you know, all of these projects were. Um, collaborative from the beginning, mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that ideas were hatched around a table, sometimes embarrassing things would put, be put out, nobody would care. And you have to have a rule, you can't say no in the beginning. Yeah, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, and so, you know, but everybody has to speak. And so uh, in, our, in, our, in our office, we have uh, open design sessions at the table, everybody from interns to partners, 
sit at the table and we all sketch together and um, we try to insist that the younger people uh, sketch too and we, ne we never say exactly what you just said, we never say no to an idea that's thoughtful and presented, you know, thoughtfully. I would say also once you're in practice, once you have real projects, the other thing that helps, and we learned this at University of Cincinnati, where we, we led the master plan, and then architects were hired to do buildings throughout <coughs> the University of Cincinnati, and we continued to be involved. Um, for instance, the building we, we did with Frank Gehry, uh, the bioengineering building, uh, what was really critical to that collaboration being successful is we each had our own budgets. Because had Frank had all the budget, we would never have had a landscape because his building <laughs> kept going over budget. <laughs> but he couldn't, he, he, you know, the president was like, sorry, that's their budget and that's your budget. So, but it was fun. At the end, uh, he was very happy with the result of that collaboration. Uh, when you bring new people into collaborations, uh, do you, whether that's new people in your own offices or outside collaborators, um, do you have ground rules that you share with new people, new folks? I think it, it happens more organically than that. I, yeah, 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 agreed, agreed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't have ground rules in our office. You know, people ask mm -hmm. us for, um, you know, um, code of conduct, and da, 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 especially now, people mm -hmm. are really looking for guidance. But we, we've never actually done that, and it does happen more organically. Um, and usually, you know, I think we, we, we have a lot of, of the same people that we work with sort of over and over in landscape and other disciplines. Um, but but the working with new people, you know their work, you, you sort of understand how they get how they achieve their work uh, to begin with. And I don't think you would invite them in had they not shown that they can collaborate, mm -hmm. you know, well with other people ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And you need each other. And, and there is, let's not, you know, let's not sugarcoat it too much. There is a prime, you know, there is a prime consultant. And, uh, you know, sometimes there has to be a decision, you know, or a direction. But, um, but it, it really is that you need each other. Like, uh, you know, if you need, we need buildings, you need the landscape, and you need them to be equally strong in dialogue. Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's something that makes me think, uh, Mary Margaret, as we were discussing before the lecture, asked us the question, what, who put that bird's nest on top of the column? <laughs> that uh, I have to admit, I have never even seen. <laughs> um, and did that act occur naturally, or did someone get on a really tall ladder on these columns that you know, has a long history in, in the building? And it makes me think a little bit about this idea when I see your work about behavior. I mean, obviously there's, the human behavior of two people who uh, have worked together for a very long time. There's the kind of human and animal behavior of this bird's nest. There's also the behavior of your projects of, of two disciplines, that architecture behaving like landscape, um, such as the, uh, in the, in the um, Juilliard project where um, the landscape moves through the building and, you know, like, I think that often what we would see is in other interdisciplinary work, uh, these things may exist in parallel, right? Mm -hmm. Architecture, landscape, sometimes next to each other, sometimes on top, sometimes on below, but never so much like this idea, like one behaving like the other and really cutting through, or uh, conversely, landscape behaving like architecture in, in Moscow where you have a hill and the, the glass shell actually follows that contour, and mm -hmm. that's actually necessary because you can't produce the microclimates that you're trying to produce of these different four different um, ecologies of of Russia in one location in Moscow, right? So, I, I guess this on this topic of, of behavior, what I'm curious about is, what do you think the experience is for the people, the public, and the people who use your who come, go through your projects that would be different as a result of this kind of um, intersection of behaviors uh, between architecture and landscape? Well, I think it's that idea of phenomenology and things that are kind of remarkable and twisted so that you, uh, you notice. I mean, that's what we often said in our early work is we were just amplifying the phenomena that already existed and amplifying it by contrast or by doing something. And so when architecture and landscape become one, you're, you're, you're totally creating that kind of mystique. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, we like to say in, in our office that we don't like borders, and, um, and I think that actually shows in the way that we handle paving at Highline and at Zariadia Park, mm -hmm. where we intentionally try to blur edges, and so we do that with disciplines too, mm -hmm. um, whether with landscape or other, uh, you know, collaborative uh, engagements that we've had. Um, you know, it, is it is it installation design? Is it a piece of architecture? Is it, what is blur building? For what instance? is blur building? And, and, exactly. and, and even yeah. just the name, yeah, yeah, yeah. blur mm -hmm. building says it all. Um, you know, is it an is it an mm -hmm. art environment? Is it a piece of architecture? Is it uh, you know what is it? I mean, we we call, we call it a, a, a building with no form. You know, no no mass, no no taste. One of um, the, sorry, go ahead. Go, no, anyway, but uh, but I think that that's really one of the things that defines our practice, and I think mm -hmm. one of the things that we have really enjoyed with working with each other is I know that Mary Margaret thinks architecturally, and I can think mm -hmm. landscape wise, right. and so we do do we don't have to have borders between us. Exactly. One of our early, early projects, Fiddler's Green Amphitheater in Denver, was an earthen bowl to the sky. And that's really all it was about, was letting you experience the phenomenology of the sky. And then at University of Cincinnati, our goal was to create landscapes that were objects, so that people could understand that landscapes could be destinations and as much a building as the buildings were. So, yeah. It's interesting because it seems like the the margins, the, the overlaps between the architecture and landscape, that's what's getting blurred. But actually, the within each discipline, there's a kind of reinforcing, because you're doing something very different that happens from the center. And that, um, that, this, that, that one can blur certain distinctions between disciplines while also reinforcing the discipline itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, sure. well put. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's talk a little bit about climates, as I feel like particularly with Zariadi Park and the wild urbanism, um, climate, or climates plural, uh, play a pretty pivotal role. Um, and I'm interested to, to see if you could, would talk about your approach to climates uh, in terms of design methods for climates, building performance, uh, or built performance, user perception of climates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the extent to which it's primarily about comfort for you um, or user experience uh, or about pushing seasonality. Um, so let's, let's, let's start there. Well, I mean, I, I, Charles should talk about this in terms of, uh, for instance, extending, um, like under the glass crust, extending the season, you know, right. making a whole new season. Right. But I also want to talk about the fact that we are now dealing with climate change big time. So we recently started a project on the north, the north, north coast of California where all the pine trees are draw, dying because it's too hot. And so we're actually looking at bringing pine trees up from Baja to grow in northern California. Wow. So there, there is an extreme issue of climate in, in what, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And of course, floods. More and more of our projects are about floods, and floods are going to become more and more. Um, so it's it's in our work, you know, it's in everything that we do every day. Yeah, I mean, and for for us, I think we're more interested in the phenomenological or experiential aspect mm -hmm. of climate, and you know, trying to do things with with climate or with with vision, because I'm gonna call that a kind of climate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of experience too that are unexpected uh, and that do extend shoulder seasons you know that's that's mm -hmm. an that's an easy one or actually do something that um, you know to like t the humidity goes out of the air or you know there's you know when you walk by a brick wall and it's absorbed heat from the day and then it radiates it out you know just that feeling of, of, you know, kind of questioning your environment and sort of leading people to think about their environments at the same time that they're feeling mm -hmm. something that was, was unexpected. 
I mean, in our we've done temperature readings, and you know the amazing temperature readings in the parks under the trees and on natural surfaces, landscape surfaces is just uh, incredibly different than the temperature reading five feet away on the paving. Mm -hmm. And you know you can't do a children's play area now without putting it under shade because play equipment is burning children. Mm -hmm. So you know it's it's really important. And the New York Times, I'm spilling the beans, but the New York Times is researching an article for New York City about shade and just about the need for shade. So it helps because we're able to convince, you know, I'm always preaching the value of landscape and it helps when the value of landscape actually has not only monetary value, Discovery Green, a billion dollars of development because of the park, but also value to our wellness, our health, you know, our lives. Yeah, it seems like the, um, much of what you're talking about, about climate and, and cities, it does bring up one, one thought I had, which was that when we look at your work between the two disciplines, each one with its own language, each one kind of very strong on its, on its own terms, there is a, um, there is a kind of uh, shared language. And, and I think about the, uh, something I read recently that you know, between two languages, Google Translate, what they realize is very difficult to translate from one language to the other. Mm -hmm. So AI, they created a third language. And actually, that third language is what they use to connect the other two. So mm -hmm. that, so um, you, know, you translate from English into their AI language, which um, then translates to French or whatever else. Uh, and as a result, you have more fidelity right, of, mm -hmm. of each language. Right? So, the third language that I see in the work and all everything that you're showing is urbanism, right? Like in, in architecture as it relates to cities, landscape as it relates to cities. So maybe that is also as a way to think about climate because a lot of what you're saying is like, you know, it's, it's it, it, it issue or cities and, yeah. and what we do. And so much of our work now is inseparable from infrastructure. So, uh, like the project in Los Angeles, the 60 Viaduct Bridge, that's happening because a piece of infrastructure is completely changing. Our, our project in Philadelphia <coughs> is a 12-acre park that's capping over a freeway yeah. and connecting down to the Delaware River, and it wouldn't have happened had there not been need to upgrade that freeway. So, it's, Pen it's Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and Federal Highways money mm -hmm. paying that in the end is creating a place for people. In both cases, you know, infrastructure becomes... so. I think. Yeah. I mean, landscape in cities is urbanism. Yeah. You know, whether whether it's called that or not. Um, and you know, basically, I think landscape that is constructed is kind of yeah. urban, yeah. even if it's trying to recreate a kind of natural feeling. Yeah. You know, it's all artifice in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, in in all, in all ways, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so, one of the things we like to do is. And we played with this in It's Ariadia, where you, we brought in naturalistic feeling landscapes in a lot of places, and then all of a sudden there would be a hole in the ground covered in glass, you know, so mm -hmm. you, you, mm -hmm. you just know yeah, that Yeah, because there's a parking structure for, what, there's 600 a, cars? Yeah, and there. then there's, there's an unknown object that yeah. we never got drawings for. They wouldn't tell us what was under an there. An unknown object? Yeah, there was yeah. an unknown object underneath, um, underneath <laughs> our park that we never knew what it was. And so the contractor had to have high security clearance. And then one day, one day, one day, Irina, yeah. <laughs> come with me, come with me, I have something special to show you. And she said, she pulled out this, she held it for this long and put it away, that is all you can see. I mean, that, that was the it's, unknown object. It's next to the Kremlin. I it, mean, it clearly, was. it's underground connection to the Kremlin, it, to a giant bomb concrete. Or yeah, it's a giant bunker. bunker. But anyway, yeah. So that she showed me that. So we, we know where we could put real trees. Yeah, because it was a, it was an out, outline yeah. of where the real trees could go and have enough soil depth. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, maybe um, we can open up sure. questions to the audience. It's only five till three. Look at that clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. You mean the sex in the park <laughs> and the smoking cigarettes? Uh, we loved it. But there were pictures somebody took. You could see cigarettes, like you know, the glowing, but they're in the woods. Uh, no. <laughs> now, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody may have been. 
about yeah, it. I, not yeah. us. That was a, that was like a slippery slope yeah. that you were about to go down. <laughs> Jason. Yes. In the example work you showed, um, it makes sense that you end up talking about language and a shared language because it feels like there's a similarity or certainly a comfort of the way in which landscape is thinking about the making space and the way in which architecture is doing the same thing. And I don't know that that's always been the case or always been possible. Scale, technologies, I don't know what all the, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I just wonder if that feels like a reality is when you say that uh, Mary Margaret can think architecturally, but mm -hmm. it, that's what I hear. So basically right, there's right. a spatial commonality yep. that probably hasn't always been true or maybe it's been true at times. For I think it's rare, unfortunately. I think a, a lot of projects are, you do the building, you do the landscape, or you do the building and if there's $5 left, we'll plant some grass. Sorry. Yeah. No. I, <laughs> or you I, do I, the park, <clears throat> and you know, then later an architect will come and do the buildings, as opposed to you know well, collaborating from the beginning. Yeah, I guess I just think about it too. Really. Like, I often love being in this building because I can find landscape examples conditionally or otherwise. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This building this is, is a land, It's a landscape building. Yeah. It's really cool that's that what way. I mean by the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. We we were saying exactly the same thing. Yeah, and so you're right, and it's not always the case, and I think it is more and more the case, because I think part of because of the urban challenges we're faced with, it is more and more the case. Well, well I also think that lands there's a lot more um, weight on landscape to help solve real huge problems in the world that I think. Pre, in previous generations, it was mm -hmm. really much more decorative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and I think that because of that, and because architecture too needs to solve problems, they have to be working in lockstep. And mm -hmm. I think that there's been a general mm -hmm. tendency for them to be coming together in a lot of people's practices. I mean, we're not the only ones that are working in a very coordinated way. But I will say that I have worked with other landscape architects who were very no pun intended, territorial. Mm -hmm. And and they, they were just like, mm -hmm. that. this is, d don't talk don't about this. It. This mm -hmm. is what, what I'm doing here. You can start from here. Mm -hmm. uh, the Blur Building actually resulted from a dispute that, I, that we had with our landscape architect. Mm -hmm. and, oh, we, and we left <clears throat> we left the mainland and went out into the, into the lake <laughs> in protest. Oh, <laughs> fascinating. And there's still occasionally, you know, architects who will say things like, I don't want you to do that because it's too strong and it's not in service of the building. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. com it, it competes too much. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Paula. Yeah. think in some ways our practices have evolved in similar ways so much of our, our early work you know we were unknown we did we had low budgets and our early work was about phenomenology you know how can you make a bowl to the sky powerful how can you take a garbage dump and put a lid on it a soil lid on it and what can you do with that garbage dump you know again low budget but sculpt you know sort of very very working with artists a lot in our, our early career and so moving from phenomenology to m more and more complex projects and systems and so moving more into systems based work and then uh, now moving more and more into infrastructure work so I think it has been a kind of growing up you know, yeah, I mean, I, us too. You know, like yeah. Liz and Rick started the practice with credit cards and a shoestring. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, and and you know, we've the the practice has continued continued to grow to the point where we're mostly working on public projects. And what we've realized as we've grown the practice is that oh wow, this is re it's really important that this work do as much as it can for as many people as I said. Mm -hmm. I've said this several times today as much as it can, for as many people as it can, for as cheap as it can, for as long as it can. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, that you know, that, that's a new ethos. That's, that wasn't the way it started. Mm -hmm. When it started, Liz and Rick were like, I'm going to do something really badass clever. 
you know, like it's got nobody, people are like, how'd you do that? That's not, that's not what it's about anymore. Mm -hmm. But we, we do like to still have that sort of like, mm -hmm. oh, look, nah, no hands kind of moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think about in our early work, at Harlequin Plaza was that kind of early work of like, mm -hmm. let's do something badass, you yeah. know? And, and now we're making huge landscape systems that will evolve over time and the, you know, the plants have as much to say as, and the dirt. Yeah. We always say, you know, landscape construction is liquid. Building construction is solid, but landscape construction is liquid. So you have to realize you're working with liquids. Dr. Mm -hmm. you had a question? Or, oh. Yep. Where you were working, I don't know if it was Doug Hollis, but it was an architect. It was, it was Doug Hollis and Mark Mack. And Mark Mack. Mm, and yep. There was this kind of precondition mm. of drawing, and you right. used a sandbox. Right. So everybody would use the same thing. That's right. And That's so cool. my question to you is, what, has anything changed, or? Well, we, we're still using clay. I, I was recently, so yes, there were two rules. You had to show it in the sandbox, and you couldn't say no. And uh, so that's the way we started. I mean, you remember that studio. I mean, it was, it almost fell down in the earthquake, but you know, it was so great. But um, recently, Catherine Sievet Nordenson, some of you may know her, had me come to City College to do a lecture on how to use clay. So <laughs> it's like, here are the tools. You get it hot in the oven or the microwave. You add oil if you need to. You add pigment if you want color and you can make it sharp. You can make it, yeah, so no, we're still, we're still, you know, it still helps. Like in, in London, we wouldn't have been able to move that fast mm -hmm. because for both Olympics, we had incredibly tight deadlines because guess what? The games will happen. So um, using clay, you know, big model, everybody could come, everybody could participate, can communicated we, ideas. Can we make it? We're working on a, pr a project right now together. We should. I think we should make a clay model I of the great. pixels <laughs> yeah. because I think the client. Fractals. Uh, the fractals, sorry, fractals. <laughs> the, the, the client is really not going to understand it if, if they don't see something, mm -hmm. you know, three dimensional. That's great. Anyway, yeah. I'll come over and help you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in charge. <laughs> I'm just curious, I have a conversation time? about oh, uh, you know, blurred disciplinary lines. Yeah. What are the lines you still draw in the sand disciplinary? Okay. Mm. And if okay. I make it more blunt, uh, okay. when do you decide I can hire an architect in my office as a landscape architect or vice versa? That's so interesting because you know some architecture firms are hiring, doing their own landscape, um, yep. and vice versa. <coughs> I just there's something more to be gained by the collaboration than there is by it always being here and in, in here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's much going to be much stronger if you if you collaborate with others. But uh, the drawing the line, we have had a case where we had to draw a line because of two very famous architects. Uh, very bad boy architects both wanted to create a big glass roof and have a natural California landscape grow under it. And we had to say the landscape is not going to be happy under this big, big glass roof. You just can't do that. You can't make a native California landscape under a glass roof. And sure enough, all the people who were going to work in that space were like, and we don't want that much light. So, you know, the, the, uh, 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 it's hard when architects want to make biophilic design inside, and those plants and people don't like the same environment. Mm -hmm. So that's often a, a, a real dilemma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it. Um, I have a question uh, that's related to uh, the illicit use of projects, which I think is really interesting. You know, specifically Sixth Street Bridge on um, Los Angeles. Uh, you know, the LA River has constantly had you know an almost direct impact on the culture of the city on how people have adapted and used it you see it in film um, and i was wondering if the way you saw people use the bridge as it first opened in its many spaces um, a do you embrace that and b has it a kind of impacted phase two uh, on the other side from climbing to you know yeah. haircuts in the middle of the street or yeah yeah I mean, great, great question. I mean, we, we envisioned it as a very, cinem a very cinematic, if that's the right experience, because of the way the arches work and the way it unfolds and the view to the skyline and letting people up there once it was complete. The joyousness was just unbelievable and the exhilaration of being up there. And yes, they started 
fucking climbing those arches. <laughs> and uh, so, imme yeah, immediately they're, you know, adding some barriers, you know. So, um, and then the, the old cars, they had the old cars up there. So it was like, you know, parade of the old cars. And then people didn't want to stop. You know, they didn't want to release that public realm back to cars, which was just fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of sort of education and a lot of arrest, but as the sheriff said, we cannot arrest our way out of this. So it had to be a behavioral kind of uh, change and it will help when the park is there because then there'll be more ways to experience it because there's these beautiful ramps that go up and down. One's like a big paper clip and one is a spiral and they're for bikes and pedestrians. And once there's a park to go down to and then to come back up from and that interplay, I think, I think it will help. But it certainly has opened the eyes of the leaders of the city into, oh my God, we have to put in place a lot more than we realize in terms of management, operations, you know, protecting this park so it doesn't, you know, once it's built, so it doesn't get torn up, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, p parks are interesting. I mean, we've experienced this with Highline, you know, yeah. it, it, it was, it became so popular and yeah. so, uh, also such a such a catalyst for development that in fact it, it backfired you probably heard some of the stories that uh, all of the businesses that 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 um, were used by a lot of the local populations that were in the NYCHA housing left because they couldn't afford the rent and so the the local residents who had been there for decades found themselves you know without any services and um, so parks I think even more than building are have <clears throat> they can actually be more successful than we ever imagined you know mm -hmm. and you know attract kinds of uses that you can't predict you know it's and that's one of the wonderful beautiful things about making parks and landscape uh, is is that you love to see people using it however they feel like using it but mm -hmm. then it can get a little it can get a little tricky mm -hmm. uh, too uh, not just for the people in the park, but for the people around the park or yeah. whatnot. Maybe one last question. Any last? Yes. What's interesting in, in terms of landscape architects in neither culture were there really a, was there really a community of landscape architects so in Zariadia we did work with a local landscape architecture firm and they were so happy to have us there championing championing a role and ideas that they had not been able to champion themselves same thing in, when we worked on the Olympics in Sydney they actually brought our office there to work with their office, the Government Architects Design Directorate, just to help elevate the field of landscape architecture in Australia. But I don't know about architecture. Yeah, they love it, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I think th I think a landscape, there's a, there's a more of a disjunct, I think, with landscape architecture than there yeah. has been with architecture. I mean, I, you know, I often feel like this country is doesn't have the most sophisticated relationship to architecture, right. but has done a great job of mm -hmm. advocating for landscape design. Right. In fact, right. I look at cities like Houston where we grew up, right. and I see they're actually starting to build nice buildings now. Don't get me wrong, including right. one of ours. But um, <laughs> but uh, but but for the longest time, it was really just about park making, and yeah. and and there wasn't a belief system around mm -hmm. uh, public building making or, or architecture as mm -hmm. a as a as a key to to making a city fantastic and so that's a really good point it's like in the u.s <coughs> we're, we're using architecture and architects from around the world to help us elevate yes. the conversation about buildings yep. and the opposite is happening yep. in terms of landscape yeah, although the french have for years been doing so yeah, there's great things. there's great landscape architects out there but i think that the adoption of landscape design and park making mm -hmm. is is very it's very of a high order in this mm -hmm. country higher order than in m most other places right now maybe that's because you know they have the garden de tuileries in paris yeah. and there's versailles you know like they have these old fashioned you know in, mm -hmm. in europe at least and mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know it it feels like you know we're still exploring what landscape means in this country and somehow we've been able to have 
have a position about what what the future might look like. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yep. I have a question about beautiful work. Um, I've been following your practices for many years. So you talked a lot about architecture and landscape, but I, I do have a question about the political landscapes in which you work. I was really struck by the image of the postage stamp. Mm -hmm. um, your candle, we all know about architects and your candle readers. Looks like a boomerang from the top, but in that postage stamp, it looks pretty foul. And I'm just thinking about <laughs> foul. Way. You said foul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think that before the invasion of Ukraine, the, that postage stamp might have looked a little bit different. But I see you working in contexts mm -hmm. which um, the political systems are less free than what we enjoy here, mm -hmm. and um, your projects can be much like the image of the postage stamp. Um, be used in ways that obviously you can't control, and it's not a reason not to go into these places, um, but sometimes bringing in international firms can be used to kind of, uh, you know, as tarnish symbols of progress, right? Mm -hmm. um, when maybe progress is happening more slowly in political systems than we'd like to see. So, again, it's not so much a criticism as a curiosity about how, what conversations you're having in your offices, Mm -hmm. about what it means to work in some of these places and how yeah. you think about your projects over time when things happen that you can't control. Maybe I'll just jump in real yeah. quick. Um, you, you know, I think Mary Margaret mentioned we almost left the project. There were some political things going on in, in Moscow. Again, the ruble collapsed and they changed the budget. They didn't even tell us by how much. Um, and they were sort of taking us out of the conversation. And then we came back and I, I know that when I had to, backing up, we decided to take that project because the, the brief was so well written. It was an international group. The, the city architect was really connected. <coughs> and Putin was less, <coughs> less Putin-y. <coughs> and he was really not involved. And he wasn't involved until the opening. And right. then we had a... Putin patrol that would go in advance and tell us where he was in the park so that we wouldn't be photographed with him. This sounds good. This sounds, you know, really like petty, but actually it's part of... It was really important. It's part of what we think about uh, in both... I, I'm working in Hungary right now. I'm doing another big project there. And, um, you know, the way I think about these places is... There are leaders in countries that, that are, you know, these, this is not Saudi Arabia with Sharia law, which we refuse to work in, we just right. don't. Um, but these are countries that have, they're mostly democratic, but with some bad leaders and hopefully over time things will change. We certainly like to think about how our projects can contribute to uh, a society and, um, and the way people relate to one another or we'd make social architecture that's really what we do and so we th we always think of it as an opportunity um to to help places uh or at least give them different ways of of uh, being in in space together i don't know when you well yeah we're creating public realm and in moscow we created a place of true public common ground that's open to everyone and used by everyone. Now, unfortunately, recently we have seen footage of protesters being beaten up by police in Zariadia Park. So we managed to create that place where protests could happen. So I guess that's something to be, uh, mm -hmm. to think about, but uh, yeah, tragic. But we, we talked a lot about it at various points for sure. Thank you very much, Mary Margaret and Charles. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.